Good evening, everyone. I'm Joanne Curry, Vice President of External Relations at Simon Fraser University. And it's my privilege to speak to you today from the unceded traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish. It's my pleasure to introduce now Amanda Nahaney, whose ancestral name is Shamatsut from the Squamish and Niska Nations. Amanda is here on behalf of her community to welcome us to these territories, share some history of the land, and lead us in song and dance. Hoichka Osiem Kayachtin Tiskohomish, a slow toll, a hamasquim of Ochomel, Yewan Hats and Squalo and Teat Seats, Nesta Ants, Shaman Soka Shaman, Tanachan Class, Kohomish Oath, and Niska Oath. I would like to share a song. Well, first, what I just said was Kayachtin, welcome. Welcome to the traditional homelands of the Skohotmish, the Hamathquim, and the Skohotmish. Feels really good in my heart to be here today. My ancestral name is Shamasot. I come from the Squamish and Niskat Nation. And I would like to share a song to start off in a good way. <clears throat> Normally, I'd get everyone to dance, but with COVID, we're just going to stay in our places. So, this song I'm going to share with you. This is the snowbird song. And as we're getting ready to get into the winter season, I just thought it'd be appropriate to share the song. The song comes from my great, great, great grandmother, uh, Sasolia. So this is um, the snowbird song. <clears throat> it's a prayer song. So while I'm singing this song, let's give thanks for the bounty we have in our life, the beautiful land. Let's pray for the people who are suffering from the floods, suffering from the devastation of losing their homes. Let's pray for them for their safety and security. And let's give thanks for all the wonderful bounty that we have in our life. Which <clears> goes <throat> down. Thank you so much. In our traditional ways, in our longhouses, we have feasts for usually weeks, sometimes months. And we invite all of our friends and our families, our connections from the different nations throughout the Northwest Coast. And so they would paddle down, because we didn't have highways, we didn't have cars. So people would paddle by canoe up and down the west coast, and we would host them. We'd make sure we'd feed them the whole time they're here. We'd, they would stay with us in our longhouses, and we would feast, and we'd do ceremony, and we would reconnect with one another, and we would strengthen our economic ties with one another. And sometimes we don't really have the time to stop and clap for every good thing that we see, so what we do is we hold our hands up like that, so I invite you all you know, if, if, 
staying in our territory or attending events in our territory, feel free to, to go like that, to say thank you. Especially when you see traditional welcomes and you see Coast Salish people, it makes us feel really good to see that. So I'd like to see everyone, just raise your hands like that. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Amanda, for this important history, your wisdom, and for your moving song and words that set us up in a very good way to start this evening. And thank you all for joining us today. There's people in person and online at Hope and Resistance Stories of Climate Justice. This is the keynote event of SFU's Public Square's 2021 Community Summit Series, Towards Equity. And this event is being produced in partnership with Van City. Growing out of SFU's vision to be Canada's engaged university a decade ago, SFU Public Square is a signature community engagement initiative. It holds space for SFU and its communities to work collectively to achieve sustainable outcomes to society's complex and urgent problems. Their annual community summit is a multi-day exploration of issues, uh, issues such as disinformation, isolation, and social and economic inequities. Through intensive programming that leverages the research excellence of SFU and the on-the-ground expertise of our community partners, the Community Summit raises the profile of a major challenge and its potential solutions. This year's Summit Towards Equity has taken place primarily online through 2021 due to the pandemic. And its driving question is, what must we understand and do to recover equitably from the pandemic and reimagine our systems to confront the intersecting crises of inequality, systematic racism, and climate change? It is a big question. To weave together these many threads, this keynote event focuses on climate justice, an approach and a movement that recognizes that the negative social, economic, and health impacts of the climate change disproportionately affect marginalized communities who are the least responsible for them. And that addresses systematic, that addressing systematic social and economic inequities must be embedded with climate solutions, following leadership from those most affected communities. We are so honored tonight to have three climate justice leaders. Melina Labakan Massimo, Anjali Padurai, and Naisha Khan. Here with us this evening to dissect the results of COP26, Global T Climate Summit, and center hope and joy in fighting the climate crisis. I'd also like to note that Naisha is a member of the Towards Equity Advisory Committee, and these members have provided guidance to Public Square uh, to help shape this event. I'd like to pass on my gratitude to members of this group that include Alexander Dirksen, Chuka Ejekam, Joel Harnest, Shupalat Mott Siam, Chief Leanne Joe of the Squamish Nation, Minakshi Mano, Angie Oshishoff, Lily Raphael, Crystal Rentschler, and last but not least, Tina Strelke. SFU is so proud to support this conversation as part of our commitments to sustainability, reconciliation, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. We're committed to bold actions for a better future and advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals through all our work, our research, our teaching, learning, operations, and community engagement. Our most recent action has been a commitment to full divestment from fossil fuels by 2025 and signing on to the UN Race to Zero so that by 2035 we will have reduced to zero all direct admissions. I thank our Board of Governors, the Investment Advisory Committee, the Responsible Investment Committee for driving this commitment, but special recognition has to be paid to SFU 350 and the many student activists who continue to push us and raise awareness for the power of the impacts we all can make. With all of this, it's a natural fit to partner with our longtime collaborator, Van City, to produce this event in particular. 
Van City has been a supporter of SFU Public Square and its community summits since its very beginnings. And we've seen that Van City has continued to show leadership in so many areas, particularly climate change. Van City has set commitments to tackle its financed emissions and help address the social and economic inequities tied to the climate crisis. I'd like to invite Jonathan Fowley, Van City's Chief External Relations Office, Officer, to the stage. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks, Amanda. That was a lovely introduction. My name is Jonathan Fowley. Uh, I'm Van City's Chief External Relations Officer and Head of our Impact Strategy uh, Group, um, which oversees our approach to finance emissions, to climate action, to climate justice, anti-racism, and reconciliation. So I'm here tonight just to give a bit of a sense of this event, uh, why we collaborate with it, and uh, what it means to us. I want to start with the words hope and joy. Promised in tonight's program, those are two words that don't often get associated with climate justice. Instead, we find ourselves grappling with the feelings of fear and grief, evidence the people of Lytton who overnight this past summer lost their entire community, or the estimated 595 people who died during the summer's heat dome, many alone and in isolation. Or those tonight in places like Merritt and Abbotsford, Cook's Ferry Indian Band, and Nowatch First Nation, who are weary from recent evacuations or their community being stranded and now, as we gather here and watch online, they're having to brace for yet another storm, and then yet another storm, and then yet another. Or think of what every parent feels tonight when dreaming of their kids. Mine are five and eight, and I worry for the world they are set to inherit. So yes, fear and grief are far more familiar companions on this journey than hope and joy. Climate action calls on all of us to make urgent change, to remake our economy, in hopes we can limit this crisis to just 1.5 degrees of global warming. The task is as big as it is important. Climate justice, on the other hand, demands a society-wide recognition that climate change is not just about the environment, but fundamentally, it's about people. That the changes already happening to our world will be magnified by privilege and by so many other social systems that fuel inequity and that those who have had the least to do with creating this crisis are also likely to be those most affected by its impacts and the least likely to be able to adapt. On behalf of Van City, I wanna thank SFU for its leadership in creating this space for this conversation. The voices we will hear tonight are so important, and especially now, at this very moment when we all, hopefully, still have time to act. Van City is helping to collaborate on this event because we believe so strongly in the power of individuals coming together in common purpose to make big change. Because we believe all conversations about climate must also include considerations of people, equity, and justice. And because we believe hope and joy are such necessary tools for the work that lies ahead. I look forward to learning more from our speakers tonight, and I look forward to feeling hope and resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your words and for Van City's commitment. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to quickly cover some housekeeping notes. I thought I got out of housekeeping this evening, but not quite. To make this event more accessible, we have closed captioning available, and there is a link to the closed captioning on the page. This event is also being recorded and will be shared on SFU Public Square's YouTube channel and an email to all of you in the next few days. We ask that you respect the community guidelines that you agree to as part of registering for this event so we can have a safe, honest, socially accountable dialogue together. And we remind everyone with us at the Colch this evening to please keep your masks on. A quick overview of the evening. We'll begin with a short presentation from each of our speakers, followed by a conversation between them and our wonderful moderator, Nala Ayad who will then field questions from the audience. And we'll be taking these questions via Slido, which is a site you can easily access on your phone or computer, and you do not need to sign up for an account or download an app. 
just go to sli.do on your web browser and enter the code 151025, which you should see on the screen as well as in chat. Feel free to submit your questions at any time. After the question and answer period, our panel is going to spend a few moments hi highlighting grassroots organizations they feel we should be aware of and supporting. And then Amanda is going to come back and close the event with a song. Now, to carry us through to this event, I am very proud to pass the mic to your moderator this evening, Nala Ayad. Nala is the host of Ideas on CBC Radio 1, and is an award-winning veteran of foreign reporting. First in the Middle East, where she spent nearly a decade covering conflicts in the region, and later, while based in London, she covered some of the major stories of our time, Russia's annexation of Crimea, Europe, Europe's refugee crisis, the Brexit vote, and its fallout. Her 2012 book, A Thousand Farewells, A Reporter's Journey from Refugee Camp to the Arab Spring, was shortlisted for a Governor General's Award. And she's received many other awards and distinctions throughout her career, including three honorary doctorates. Please allow me to welcome Naila Ayad. Thank you very much, Joanne, for the introduction. And thank you, Amanda, for starting us off in such a beautiful way. Until a few weeks ago, the extreme weather term atmospheric river was not in common usage, nor was the notion of, an entire, of entire farm operations being submerged and abandoned. The collapse of critical highway infrastructure leading to the tragic loss of life and the interruption of our food and goods supply chains continue, all directly related to climate change and all being played out as we speak in British Columbia. Not to mention, of course, the devastation and hundreds of deaths in the summer months from extreme heat and wildfires. The effects of climate change are being felt around the world, affecting especially the vulnerable, but threatening to make us all vulnerable. To discuss how hope and joy are essential parts of fighting the climate crisis, to share stories of communities defending their land, water, and climate within Canada and around the world, and to analyze the results of COP26, recently held in Glasgow, and how we move forward, I am very proud to introduce, for Hope in Resistance, Stories of Climate Justice, produced in partnership by SFU Public Square and Van City. So let me introduce you to the panelists. Anjali Apadurai spent her early career building a strong civil society voice at the UN Climate Convention, working with social movements from around the world to demand climate justice at a multilateral level. She's now the climate justice lead at Sierra Club BC and sectoral organizer with the newly formed Climate Emergency Unit, a project of this David Suzuki Foundation. She's also a singer, a songwriter, and music producer. Welcome, Anjali. Naisha Khan is an 18-year-old uh, second-generation Bangladeshi settler who has been a climate and racial justice organizer for the past two years as a central organizer of sustainability teams, co-founder of Banking on a Better Future and organizer with Climate Strike Canada. She's currently attending UBC and advocates for intersectional justice at Climate Justice UBC and in her local city of Surrey. Please welcome Naisha. Last but not least, Melina Labukan Massimo is Lubicon Cree from Northern Alberta. She's the founder of Sacred Earth Solar and co founder and Healing Justice Director at Indigenous Climate Action. She's also the host of Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy in Indigenous communities across the country and holds a master's degree in Indigenous governance from the University of Victoria. Please welcome Melina. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. I'm very excited to hear your presentations. And I know, of course, you've got prepared presentations for all of us. Um, but I just wanted to kind of check in quickly. It's been a very long year. <laughs> uh, 
And if it's not what's happening now outside, you know, in British Columbia, you've also had COP26. Angela, you were there. Naisha, you've recently finished uh, midterms and organizing a protest, I think, <laughs> <laughs> just in her spare time. Uh, and all of you, of course, are experiencing, uh, you know, life in these extreme circumstances. I just want to ask, how are you doing? Naisha. Yeah, um, it's definitely been a lot. Um, going to school full time and then having to deal with the climate crisis is a lot to deal with, especially when you're 18 years old. But I'm managing to survive. I have a really strong community. I have really strong supports with my friends and family. Um, but it's definitely not easy seeing all of the climate news that has been happening. Um, and it's been really motivating me to take action. Thank you. Melina. I'm doing okay. I, the same thing. It's hard to take in all the news. Um, after organizing on climate for over 15 years, it's hard to not feel like I told you so, um, like a lot of other folks that have been doing that work for longer than me. Um, so it's hard not to um, feel despair, but also it's a good reminder to feel hope and joy um, as a form of resistance and as a form that, that joy and rest and resistance is revolutionary as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Anjali? I feel similarly... Um, I've, I've really had to learn after years of doing this work that um, my sort of mantra is so within, so without. So I, I have learned to prioritize joy and I've learned to prioritize pleasure as a political act. And that has helped me, I think, be better in this work. <clears throat> What's it like to be on the stage together? Naisha, this is a first for you. Yeah, um, it's definitely a change of pace from the rallies that I'm used to. Um, it's the first time I've had something, gone to something professionally organized. It's not just a bunch of teenagers, um, <laughs> which is nice to see. Um, also, I'm just surrounded by powerful women of color, and that is a really nice change of pace. And lastly, I was curious, you two know each other. How do you know each other? Climate justice organizing. Yeah. <laughs> I think we actually met on stage in 2013 for oh the first God. time at Power Shift, Power Shift. and yeah. um, I was keynoting and Anjali was moderating. So yeah. yeah. And you meet again. And we see each other. I mean, we know each other and we've yeah. yeah. Also trying to have joy in amongst the despair. Yeah. So, so let's, dancing. <laughs> let's get to that part then. So Anjali, you're going first. You're giving right. you a presentation, I believe. So yeah, please start. Um, Thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, I feel so blessed to share the stage with these two climate justice sisters. And um, it makes it's a very safe and nice feeling to be on stage uh, with all of you today. And um, I am so grateful to be able to do this work on unceded Coast Salish lands. Um, I'm Anjali. I am uh, an organizer. I am a communicator. Um, I am a, uh, a connector uh, in this wild world of climate justice. I've occupied different corners of the climate justice movement. Uh, started off as a youth organizer, um, organizing youth from around the world at um, the UN Climate Convention, or the UNFCCC, as we call it. And um, um, before that, I, I did local work here uh, with my high school um, with, in partnership with the Canadian Red Cross. Um, and I never thought of myself as an environmentalist. I thought of myself as a humanitarian. Um, and it wasn't until I attended the first UN conference um, back in 2010, my first UN conference back in 2010, that I began to understand um, this complex issue of climate justice as one fundamentally of, of um, survival, of, of colonialism, of debt, of inequality, and really of, of uh, justice um, in a really complex and multi-layered way. And so, um, and then it was just, uh, my journey continued from there, and now I work uh, with environmental nonprofits here um, to um, communicate on climate justice and to, and to organize. Um, we are firmly in an age of climate-driven disaster. And uh, this past six months has shown us here in BC that um, you know climate change knows no borders and it knows no um, 
Yeah, it knows no borders. And so the emergency that has been affecting, first of all, indigenous peoples for hundreds of years, but also uh, mostly communities in the global south over the past um, 20, 30 years, that emergency has reached us in BC. It shows the non-discriminatory nature of, of climate change. And um, it puts our choices um, in stark um, uh, in stark contrast. Um, and so I think it's really important to acknowledge that we're in this age of, dis of climate disaster, disaster um, and it's important to accept that and to understand the beast so that we know how to use our collective energy to tackle it. Um, so I've been involved with the UN process for about 10 years now, and um, I've learned in that process that climate change is the result of colonialism and of a deeply unfair global economic system that like a, a hungry, violent god requires sacrifice to sustain itself. And that sacrifice has taken the form of um, indigenous black and brown bodies um, and traditional ways of knowing. And it was colonialism that laid the groundwork for the extractive industries that would then create and exacerbate the climate crisis. And so it's those dots that it is absolutely imperative for us to connect, especially as we enter this age of climate breakdown um, and to begin to understand this beast. So that link between land dispossession and corporate power and fossil fuels and climate change is, is one that's at the heart of the crisis. And that same um, sort of uh, log jam is the same story that's playing out all over the world. Um, land dispossession laying the way for extractive industries, which are then protected um, by governments, um, which then have created the crisis that we find ourselves in. So that's the story at the heart of climate injustice. So if that's the logic, the logic holding you know, land dispossession and corporate power and fossil fuels together is what created the crisis, then what takes us out of it has to be the fundamental opposite logic. And so this is what has been frustrating in my journey of um, being a part of the UN Climate Conference, um, and especially this one, it, this last one, COP26 in Glasgow, is, is watching the rhetoric and the narratives around uh, climate solutions be thrown around and seeing so many false solutions um, be put forward. Um, if we, if we look at that logic that holds colonialism and capitalism and extractive industries together, a false solution is something that seeks to solve the problem through the same logic and through the same framework that created it. And that's how we can spot a false solution. But unfortunately, we saw so much widespread acceptance and so much lauding of false solutions at COP26. Um, one of the biggest sort of um, false false solution narratives that is a large part of the climate discourse in Canada is this idea of net zero. Um, and that, that concept has been embraced by governments uh, around the world and by the corporate sector. Um, but to me, net zero is a concept that leaves large loopholes, that is born of the same logic that created the climate crisis and is just an act of smoke and mirrors that will not actually get us to the solutions that we need. Um, net zero allows us to um, basically prioritizes corporate power and, and, um, uh, and paves a pathway for extractive industries to continue to do as they please far past any of the deadlines that will actually take us to, to um, a climate safe future. Um, Another false solution narrative that has been really prevalent in this time has been that of nature-based solutions. Um, and, uh, you know, these are terms that are thrown around and, and, and are so deeply embedded in the climate narrative at this point that they, that they sound perfectly benign and they sound actually positive and they sound, um, they sound constructive. But um, you just have to sort of look at who embraces a concept to see 
what logic that concept is born out of. And the, the idea of nature-based solutions has been embraced wholeheartedly by the corporate sector, by sort of greenwashing companies, by the fossil fuel industry, and um, by governments that have placed profit over people and the planet. And so this idea of the smoke and mirrors and the false solutions is the mire that we wade through at these, at these conferences and in the UN process. Um, so I think we came out of COP26 with a lot of big, shiny announcements on the table. Um, Canada participated in that. And, you know, I think there's, there, are, there are good good things that will come out of those announcements. But ultimately, um, I think we are in an age where it's up to people to disrupt now because we've seen governments choose... Um, the wrong side of history one too many times. We've seen crystal clear policy choices that should show us very clearly that um, our governments um, certainly don't have our best interest at heart when it comes to the climate crisis. And there's a, there's a failure in leadership that it is up to us to counter. Um, so these crystal clear policy choices, you know, are playing out right now in this, in this era of climate breakdown. You know, there's a policy choice to deploy our CMP resources to arrest land defenders when there are climate disasters happening right here that critical help is needed for. It's a policy choice to um, not mandate an immediate wind down of the fossil fuel industry in the interest, in the long term interests of people and the planet. Um, these are these are clear choices that are legitimized by the state, but aren't actually legitimate if you look at the arc of history and if you look at the climate science and if you look at um, the moral obligation of the moment. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that we are now in a time of disruption. Um, widespread climate disruption is happening all around us, and what needs to happen for each and every person now, now that there's this heightened awareness of climate change, this climate change is front of mind and it's happening all around us, um, we need to be the disruptors now. And we need to find new ways of coming together um, and prioritizing collective action and finding ways to build our power in the networks and in the institutions that we're connected to. Um, you don't have to be an activist to do this. I believe it's the age for all of us to do this. Um, so that, that's going to be my work in this, in this next chapter of climate justice. And I, um, I encourage everyone to, to, to look at the networks and to look at their lives and to look at the people that they're surrounded with and to find ways to, to come together um, and, and take real climate action. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anjali. Really very insightful uh, and raises so many questions one of which is a very practical one. I mean, not very many people here or elsewhere have been to a COP summit or a COP meeting. I'm curious if you could give us a sense of what it is like to have a conversation with you know, the, the main players on the ground who are obviously very concerned mostly about the next election cycle and who perhaps don't think long term. I, I wonder just what it's like to be navigating those discussions when you are thinking about an issue that is long-term, both past and present and future, and yet you're dealing with organizations that think so, so long, so short-term. Yeah. Um, it's been really frustrating because we started, I started as a youth activist in that space, and our slogan was, how old will you be in 2050? Because all the climate targets were talking about 2050 at that time. And, um, and, and they still are. I mean. Uh, Canada's talking about net zero by 2050. And, and I think that question, which youth movements are still asking to this day, is, is still a poignant one. How old will you be in 2050? And how much do you have at stake in this time of, of crisis? Um, I think the UN space is really important in that, as I said, climate change knows no borders. It is a collective crisis. And there needs to be a collective process. Um, to tackle it, but that process is rife with all the injustices of the world, of colonialism and of uh, colonialism in not just you know within a country like Canada, but on a global scale as well, um, and debt and inequality and 
all of these different disparities, but there's an integrity to that climate, to the UN Climate Convention that has been eroded over time, and I've, I've seen that erosion happen in my 10 years of involvement, and, and people who've been doing it longer than me have seen that erosion since the convention was founded in 1992. Um, there's an integrity to uh, you know, a promise at the heart of this UN convention that says we're all gonna come around the same table and we're all gonna do our part. And all our parts are gonna look different, but we're all gonna do our part to keep below 1.5 degrees of warming. Mm -hmm. That's our ceiling. And um, we've seen a slow slide away from sort of mandatory participation in that convention. And we've seen a slide now into a sort of volunteer, um, volunteer based system where countries can sort of just like uh, announce what they would aspirationally like to do with, without any sort of legal, legally binding mechanism to that. And that's been really demoralizing for young people like me who've grown up mm -hmm. through that process mm -hmm. um, to see like world re leaders really don't have our backs. Mm -hmm. And so then the fight returns back to our communities. I want to ask you a more personal question, which is the point that you started with in your yeah. in your uh, presentation, that you don't call yourself an environmentalist, that you're a hum humanitarian. I wonder if you could take us to the moment when you decided that you knew what the distinction was in the work that you do. Right. Well, I, I've sort of moved away from both labels at this mm -hmm. point as my understanding of the issue has evolved and I've learned from especially the incredible indigenous leaders that are leading a lot of the movements in BC um, that I, I sort of, I grew up in a time where environmentalism was really about uh, conservation, there was this sort of legacy, which is now I know a colonial legacy of, of conservation being defining the environmental movement here uh, on Turtle Island, um, where it was about cordoning off nature and saying, let's protect it. And that sort of flew in the face of uh, indigenous ways of knowing. It was a very colonial practice. And that was my understanding of environmentalism. It's about recycling and it's about conservation. And so I distanced myself from that because I, um, you know, I, I didn't resonate with that. I, I, I come from a country, I, I'm an Indian immigrant, and so I come from a place where there's so many humanitarian issues that I thought that that was, that was my job to sort of talk about war and famine mm -hmm. and sort of these like hu human issues. And um, I think, I think when I first heard the president of a small island state, um, I believe it was the Marshall Islands, mm -hmm. speak at the UN, and they spoke from the heart, and they really spoke about climate change as an issue of survival for their people, and physical survival, but also cultural survival, and um, spiritual survival, and how there were so many immeasurably precious things that would be lost if we didn't come together around this issue um, and prioritize justice at the heart of the issue. And um, that, to me, started to turn. And the indigenous-led movements that I've learned from here have taught me that it's not about um, that, that dichotomization of like humans and nature is a false one. And it's not a helpful one and it's actually kind of a violent one. If we don't see ourselves as part of the earth and as part of this symbiotic relationship um, and as part of an ecosystem, um, then we're thinking along the same colonial lines that allowed us to get into this place of climate crisis in the first place. And so I, I've, um, I've learned to sort of have a practice of of trying to acknowledge and respect all the beings around me, whether they're human or not, and not seeing them in a hierarchy of, you know, us as like a supreme species, mm -hmm. um, but not seeing not seeing nature as a separate thing either. Thank you. That's yeah. wonderful. Thanks very much, Naisha. You're next. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Naisha. I'm a second generation Bangladeshi settler. I'm typically either residing on the tradi traditional stolen and occupied Kwantlen Kate in Semiamu lands, also known as Seri BC, or the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh lands at the Point Grey UBC campus. 
I am a first year university student and I'm 18 year old climate activist organizing as a mentor for the youth climate group Sustainabilities and a co-founder and organizer with Banking on a Better Future. I just wanna take a moment to thank SFU for this opportunity. I am so honored um, that you guys chose me. I was very surprised, but very grateful. Um, I also wanna thank all the people who worked behind the scenes on this. Um, I know you might have seen mine and Anjali and Melina's face everywhere, um, but there was a whole production team working backstage and just so much valuable work. And so I just wanna take a moment to thank all those people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to start my keynote by sharing a bit of a story. A story from when I was four years old and I flew across the water for the very first time. I entered a new world and a new land where everyone looked like me, and I entered a home where everyone welcomed me. This was in my grandmother's home and where every family member had an assigned cup. My cup was a bright yellow giraffe mug. Um, I used that cup to drink water, but for the first time, I did not drink water straight from the tap. I had to use a water filter. And I'd never used a water filter before, and I began to realize the difference between Bangladesh and Canada. I remember flying back around three years ago and driving around Dhaka City. We came across the ruins of the Rana Plaza collapse, and as I stared at the rubble, I remember news stories of the lives lost and the fire that consumed the plaza. I stared at the displaced people from the comfort of an air-conditioned car. I remember feeling red hot rage and anger, but I realized who was behind this. It was the overcrowded factory was built on exploitative labor from an orange labeled company that came from Canada, the country that I was supposed to call home. But as I returned to my grandmother's home and sat in the brace of my family, eating freshly made roti and lo locally caught seafood, I really wondered what home meant to me and what had displaced my family from our land. The other day, I noticed that I was wearing a sweater that was made in Bangladesh, and it made me think about how this piece of clothing had a stronger origin to the country that I came from than I did. But I, did, I also shared a lot with that sweater because both of the threads of our identity were woven together as a result of Bengali labor and colonialism. Bangladesh is gonna be one of the hardest hit countries of climate change. They are ill-equipped to deal with the consequences with corrupt government, poor city planning, and insufficient health services. Climate change is gonna cause mass destruction. But I wanna say that Bangladesh is not poor, third world, or underdeveloped. It is over-extracted and over-exploited. It was the hands of colonialism and imperialism that caused this, and it, was not, and it is not just happening in these lands. It continues today in colonial powers where communities of color and indigenous communities continue to face the first-hand impacts of this crisis. I'm gonna be completely honest. I have been so overwhelmed by recent events. We've just come out of a record-breaking summer heat wave with severe flooding, just a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago that caused mudslides and extreme damage to the Coquihalla and to the interior, militarized RCMP violence against Wet'suwet'en land defenders, and general disappointment from COP26. These events have demonstrated a severe lack of strong political will needed to address the scale of the climate crisis. It's a lot to deal with. The climate crisis is scary and can be all consuming. I get scared, I get anxious, I get angry. But amidst that, I still have hope. Despite all the climate doomism featured in the news, I believe that we can solve this crisis and build a better world for all. A world where the earth is not just another avenue for economic growth, a world where not extracting from the land, a world where marginalized is no longer part of our vocabularies, a world where community thrives and we can enjoy nature instead of choking on the fumes of fossil fuels, where we have a regenerative and circular economy, where I am not just another token, where my voice is actually valued, and a world where I can speak my language better than the language of those who colonize South Asia. You may ask, how can we achieve this world? Well, it begins with dismantling the systems that caused this crisis in the first place. Canada is founded on settler colonialism. 
It was founded on the exploitation of lands and people, and in search for acquisition of more lands, the Crown committed and continues to commit violence to attain it. Through this, westernization, industrialization, and a capitalism have occurred to allow profit and wealth to drive everything. It disrupted our balance with nature. But settler colonialism is a state. It is a sense of being for a nation, and it was not successful. It has attempted and continues to attempt to erase the history of indigenous peoples, but they continue to be the leaders of change. Fighting for climate justice means that we acknowledge these root causes of the crisis and work to actively dismantle them. It means empowering indigenous, black, and POC voices, the ones who have been purposely excluded from this conversation. The climate movement has failed in the past, and it continues to fail. It has historically failed to center the right voices and perpetuated the same systems that caused this crisis in the first place. This is what happened at COP26. It was a green wash conference that failed to center indigenous voices, the people responsible for 80% of the world's conservation. There was a severe lack of political will and too much power given to corporations, the same powers preventing us from achieving a better world. It is essential that we uplift these voices, not only because marginalized communities are at the center of the climate crisis, because these communities have been practicing sustainability for years. We have the solution. We just need to center the right voices to make it a reality. I want to emphasize that these systems of oppression have not always existed. White supremacy has not always been the predominant state. These oppressive structures have not always prevailed, and nor will they continue to do so. We need radical action to make it a reality. We need to see radical action from the powers that be to build the world that we deserve. But radicalization is not just about danger. It is about love and joy. These systems of oppression are rooted in hate, hate for ourselves and hate for the other. And I have spent countless years hating my Bengali features, my dark skin, my hairy arms, and my thick eyebrows. But by loving myself, I am committing an act of anti-oppression, an act of resistance. I am hope in resistance. We are all hope in resistance. Through caring for ourselves, we are undoing centuries of oppression made to devalue ourselves and value money. We can recognize the world that we want to head towards, where we care for each other, a world where we value each other. By caring for ourselves, we are starting a larger revolution of care that is antithetical to capitalism and colonialism. Ideas like community and structural care, I also want to note, have been predominantly implemented by communities of color. They've been the key to building strong, resilient, healthy, and happy communities. This is just another reason why centering the right voices is essential, but also key to fighting the climate crisis. I also want to add that I don't want you to be motivated by shame. I don't want your guilt. I don't want it, because it is a form of self-hatred. I want everyone to feel empowered to take action and be motivated by the fight for our shared liberation. I want you to have hope for a better world and take the necessary action to build it. It may seem like it's a lot to fight for all of these different communities and battling different causes. Systems of oppression are well systems of oppression. Capitalism, racism, colonialism, sexism have all worked together to compound oppression for marginalized groups. But this doesn't mean that we have to fight every single fight. It means that our fight is united. In order to combat the enormity of the climate crisis, we need to combat the competitiveness and division that created it in the first place. We must work together for our shared liberation while centering we must work together to fight for our shared liberation while centering love and joy. Hope and resistance is essential. Hope and resistance is the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naisha, for a wonderful speech. So many questions, again, raised by that. I, I honed in very quickly to a statement you made, which is that you, you said in your comments that the climate movement has failed and continues to fail. Many reasons for it, you listed some of them, but I'm curious how much you think 
the lack of discussion of hope contributed to that failure? Yeah, um, there definitely is a lot of reasons why. And I think the lack of hope has, first of all, been, I think, perpetuated by this narrative of a lot of youth who, not to their fault of their own, but like have been wanting to fight for their future and have been genuinely scared. And it arises out of very valid and very understandable feelings. Um, but I think without hope, we are unable to envision the future that we actually want to achieve. Um, we're really good at seeing the problems, but we're not good at seeing the solutions. And I think when we do that, we also build solutions, like Anjali said, that are false solutions. Um, and so I think hope is really essential to that. And another thing that has really, really been perpetuated in the climate movement is capitalistic ten tendencies um, when we're not celebrating love and joy. A lot of people are doing this work because they feel scared and they feel motivated by guilt and shame, um, but they're not allowing themselves to feel that joy, and that often be leads to burnout. And I've just seen so many youth who have developed mental health issues and have just had to take complete, like have had to completely leave the movement um, because they haven't been able to develop that balance. And it's not to any fault of their own. We replicate the systems in which we grow up in. And so it's definitely a replication of capitalist systems. And I think that's been a really big way that it's impacted us. You've mentioned how a lot of youth feel fear or are scared, not only of what's happening, but also getting involved. What yeah. is it that compelled you? What was the moment that compelled you to get involved? Yeah, um, I definitely, I started my like climate journey kind of similar to Anjali, where I heard a lot about conservation being reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and so I kind of always was aware of that. But then I recently, and then in high school, I started to see a lot more youth um, take the lead and take action. Um, so in 2019, I attended the Vancouver climate, uh, the t Vancouver strike on September 20 29th in 2019. Um, which was the largest strike in Vancouver's history, actually held by Sustainability Teens, the organization that I later on joined. Um, so seeing that and seeing such really, really powerful youth voices take lead and build a narrative that was so needed and not seen before really propelled me to take action. Thank you very much, Naisha. And I just want to remind the audience that you will also have a chance to participate in the conversation. If you have questions, feel free to start putting them in through Slido. There are instructions on how to do that in the chat. So please go ahead and start doing that. Uh, Melina, it's time for you to go ahead. It is always an honor and privilege to be on Coast Salish territories, um, and I honor the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish peoples, and also thank deeply Shaman Soot, who opened us up in such a good way, um, in such a beautiful way, with such beautiful words, and such an amazing prayer song that connects us all back to spirit and ancestors, and I honor the Coast Salish ancestors that um, walk here on these lands that many of us call home. I'm actually now call home in, in the Quangan territory, so so-called Victoria. But I am, I introduce myself in my language. Um, I am Lubacan Cree, so I was born in uh, a reserve called Little Buffalo. It is in Treaty 8 territory in uh, Northern Alberta. And yeah, I'm gonna show photos just because I find um, it's easy to story tell that way. So, um, this beautiful photo in the north part of our territories, so we're from the Boreal, which is the northern lungs of Mother Earth, which is how we you know, abate climate change by keeping um, the forest, the beautiful forest in, in the ground. And my dad, um, I'm sorry for the listeners that might be listening, but I just really wanted to show photos of um, my dad, who is that small child um, up in the photo where he was actually hidden from residential schools, um, from the in in Indian agent that came into our community. Um, my cookum hid my, and I Muslim, my grandmother and grandfather, that's Cree for grandmother and grandfather, hid my dad um, until the age of nine turning 10 um, when they opened a day school. So 
I'm the first generation of uh, to not attend residential schools in my community, in my family. And so I just wanted to mention that as a part of the, the collective conversation that Anjali and Naisha have so amazingly um, set the stage of um, in terms of colonialism and how that's connected to uh, climate and environmental racism. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the really hard things to talk about today, but then I'll, I will end with um, positive stories um, of resilience and of hope that I um, have embarked on since experiencing really intense stories um, like the one you see up above where uh, my community in 2011, uh, at the time I was already a full-time climate and energy um, campaigner. I worked at Greenpeace Canada for almost a decade and um, I re received a phone call from my, my auntie who works in the school. She, taught, she teaches Cree um, for more than 30 years in our community school in Little Buffalo where I was born. And she called me and she said, we can't breathe. Our eyes are burning, our lungs, um, our, our, yeah, our eyes are burning, lungs are burning, everything's burning, um, we can't breathe. Can you tell us what's happening? Um, nobody's telling us what's going on. And so um, we had a massive oil spill. It was one of the largest oil spills in Alberta's and Canada's history. And it was an incredibly traumatizing experience. Um, the elder and elders and um, children, people that had immunocompromised um, states shouldn't have not been in the community, but no one was evacuated. So everyone was forced to breathe this air for over two weeks. It is obviously still upsetting, um, but it was the home, our homelands were destroyed and this other picture that I'm showing below was where um, we went back 15 months later and still, the land was still in, in, in distraught, in despair. And it was a horrible experience, and that's a part of why when I, after a while, I started thinking, I can't keep saying no, I can't keep banging my hand against the wall, I can't keep always fighting, um, what can I build? And that was a part of why I started building um, solar projects back home. But I think the, the big point that I wanna make here before setting that stage is, what cultural and environmental genocide is and how the encroachment, contamination and destruction of our territories where we live, breathe, um, practice our culture, traditions, languages, customs is being devastated by environmental degradation, industrialized landscapes, drained and polluted watersheds and contaminated air. And this is the stage um, in which we need to find our resilience. I think it's a lot different for folks in the cities that are very far away from sites of destruction. Um, because we have to build um, climate solutions in a different way where, where I'm from, where I was born. And you know, and this is a microcosm of a macrocosm of many communities across Turtle Island um, that are in cancer clusters, like where my family's from, and a lot of communities that I work in solidarity with, um, refinery zones, and all of the things that we, that we hear with extractivism, pipelines being constructed. Um, and so that's kind of the stage of why I ask the question many times when I speak is what, are we in an era of reconciliation? You know, I think we think about, um, you know, this, this day of now on September 30th where everyone wears orange shirts and I'm not saying that's a bad thing and I think it's an, an, an important thing for the consciousness to be raised of what happened to residential school survivors like my, all my aunts and uncles and my dad what they went through, that history needs to be known. When I was a child, the, it was not in any of the books in education and I, it was so isolating to know this history of what happened to my family and no one knew it at school. And it was a very isolating um, experience growing up um, all the way until I was in university. My first degree would when finally some students would come up to me and I just learned about residential schools, but you had to be in university to learn. Um, at the age that I was, that, you know, the generation that I'm an ex <laughs> Um, You know, and, and I won't go into this too much because they both did such a great job, but, you know, we are in a careless economy where we are living, um, you know, in so-called Canada over the bounds of, of the ways in which we should be living. We are taking globally um, the resources so people have 
barely any means to get by in other places. We are in Canada, there's a study I wanted to um, mention. It's called 1.5 Degree Lifestyles Report, where it's actually Canada was named as one of the worst per capita, per capita records by far of unsustainable lifestyles. So of course, this creates inequity globally as well as nationally. So we know that there's inequity with communities that I come from, you know, communities like where I come from, where I grew up, you know, going home where there's no paved roads, no running water, um, but $14 billion has come out of our territory and more um, from oil and gas and revenue. But yet, you know, my family still lives in subpar molding houses. We have housing crisis, water crises. We have all the crises, um, all the isms, um, highest suicide rates, all the highest everything. And, and yet we are still, you know, so we are still living in a state of neocolonialism in a state of crises where indigenous peoples are economic hostages in their own homelands. So that's why I wanna say, you know, colonialism has not ended. And the most, you know, familiar one I'm, a, I'm familiar with is um, ex resource extraction. You know, so I also question, are our rights protected in section 35 of the Canadian constitution, which is where, um, you know, our elders, the people that I look up to and respect, worked so hard, um, indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast, worked so hard to get section 35 of the Canadian constitution um, into the constitution act in 1982. This was a hard, hard, heavy lifting. And yet we still go with unprotected rights. Another point I want to make before going on to the more joyful part of this talk is, um, and I need to make mention of this, is that violence against the earth begets violence against women. And the colonial values of patriarchy and capitalism exploit the land and exploit our women. And these are not um, separate. These are inextricably linked um, issues. Um, when we violate, you know, we see the land, um, unfortunately, um, there's a hierarchy in Western society where, like Angela was talking about, um, humans being the pinnacle somehow. I don't know how we got up there, but Indigenous people see it as a circle, you know, where all living beings are connected and we do not have a hierarchy of whose lives are more important. All lives are important. All living beings' lives are important from the smallest being to the biggest being. And so this is where we differ a lot of the times of... Um, the violence against the land. And, you know, that's why I usually say that's no coincidence that women are dying like the land is dying because there's such a devaluation of land and also of women. So the question that I'll finish on for the last part of the conversation I'm having with you here today is what does a just transition look like? Um, and for me, a just transition, because um, I've consistently seen throughout my lifetime, from a young child to, you know, an adult now, seeing over and over and over Indigenous communities always facing the brunt of all the things in so-called Canada, the brunt of colonialism, the brunt of resource extraction, the brunt of environmental genocide, the brunt of environmental racism, um, the brunt of the climate crisis. Um, and so I think it's very important for Indigenous peoples to not always be at the end of the receiving line. And so for me, that's why I knew if I didn't start building um, projects that inspired me and I wanted to see in my community, they wouldn't have been built. You know, and I also want to talk about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Also, again, elders um, that worked for many, many years, close to two decades, to get that passed um, as international legislation, of which now Canada is a signatory since 2016, even though it was passed by the UN in 2007. So, you know, again, it is imperative that we um, uphold the rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so I just wanted to point that out. But I think what we're at and which gives me hope is that uh, a critical paradigm shift is needed for all people that make their home on planet Earth. Um, you know, it's, we talk about indigenous ways of knowing and being, but we need all people to have these ways of knowing and being. Because we need to have reciprocity with Mother Earth. You know, if we go hiking and enjoy a place somewhere hiking, we have responsibility to that place. We can't just come and go when we choose. We have responsibility if we drink from that water. We have a reciprocal relationship with that water. And so that is why you see so many Indigenous peoples on the front lines 
fighting for their lives with their very bodies, the last resource that we have left of our bodies, because so much has been taken already that we put our bodies on the front line. And so that is what I ask everyone here today and everyone that's watch it, watching to, to really dig down deeply and, and, and try to really assess what is your responsibility of where you make your home. You know, we talk about returning to a zero waste communities. Indigenous have always been zero waste, just going to say. Um, and also, for me, hope and resistance was building community-based solar um, back home. This was the first time we actually ever had solar panels. Um, we called our project Pitapan, which in Cree means the, the coming of the dawn, the rising of the new era, which meant that we, you know, saw my whole life growing up was extractivism all around. There's a cut line, there, which a cut line was just industry at the end of that road, another cut line, industry at the end of that road. You see them anytime you drive home, cut line, cut line, cut line, cut line, cut line, cut line. And you always know what's going to be at the end of that road. Um, so we never had solar panels ever in our community. And it was actually one of the few times I've ever seen solar panels. This project, um, I worked to fundraise for and build, and this project went up in 2015. And so that was Carlton, actually. Um, he's 21, and he, you know, we just opened the first box of panels and be like, wow, look at this. Um, my auntie, who's in her 70s, um, now probably in her 80s, she came up to me during the solar feast and said, oh, I never thought I'd see solar panels in my life. I always seen them on TV. Um, that's how we talk back home. But, um, <laughs> and I always go back into like my bilingualism res accent when I go home. But anyways, um, try to pull that one out for you. But so this is many youth from back home that... Um, helped us build these panels. Um, it's right beside the community school from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, and it's the final installation is a 20.8 20 kilowatt system that powers our health center. Um, and it's been running now for six years. And the thing that, the reason why I wanted to build it was for the young people, for these, you know, kindergartens, grade one, grade two, that would know um, that they wouldn't have to be entrenched in a one-way system of constantly having to be force-fed the fossil fuel regime, that this is the only way that you can live, breathe, and work. And for us, we wanted to build this to try to start new ways of being, either if you want to be an electrician, if you want to be building things like what we built, you know, and we had a solar feast, a solar launch, and it was just one way, you know. I know that this solar is only a transition technology. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, we have uh, renewable energy still creates extractivism, so we need to be real about that. With lithium mining, we need to be real about that. So I think for me, even as I progress in my climate journey, um, you know, how we need to call out net zero, how do we find these solutions? And we're all... We all need to be a part of the solutions and try to find different ways of building the future. And we've also solarized communities on the front line through my organization called Sacred Earth Solar um, with Sequetmic women on the front lines of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. We've also solarized with Sowetan um, in three cabins up in Gidendam Checkpoint. And I don't know if they've been slashed to pieces, but by the RCMP as 11 people just got arrested this past weekend. Um, but we continue to build these types of projects. We also sent um, solar equipment and communication devices to land defenders in Ferry Creek. Uh, we also um, work with different indigenous organizations like the Onaman Collective that was founded by um, Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch to build language and cultural revitalization on our homelands. I think one of the things that also is hope and resistance is teaching the young people as young as they can to start now. And so this is us um, teaching, you know, grade kindergartens and grade fives and grade six. They think about these things. They had their hands up and said, like, you know, I said, okay, hey, what do you think about the solar panels outside now that it's up? And they're like, what happens when the sun doesn't shine? You know, they think, they're grade five. Like, we, did, like, we think that they don't think about when you flick on the lights, but this this needs to be taught from a very, very young age, um, not just when we were, you know, 20s and things like that. Um, another um, 
a hopeful thing that I would really encourage anyone, if you want to have a little jolt of hope every day, I encourage you to watch Power to the People, which is a 13-episode series that I was very fortunate to be able to host, and we traveled from coast to coast to coast to 26 locations across the country and interviewed indigenous leaders about all of the different food security, eco-housing, renewable energy systems that they were putting up to prepare um, for the climate crisis, climate, climate adaptations. So there was, um, if I had more time, I would show a video of Power to the People, but um, if you do want to watch about what people are doing in action, you know, climate action, you can check it out on powertothepeople.tv or you can stream it online as well. Um, so to finish, I just want to talk about how um, supporting Indigenous resistance is hope for me. Standing in solidarity with Indigenous peoples and frontline land defenders is hope to me. And also that we also need to stop criminalizing Indigenous peoples that are protecting their homelands and stop dragging them off of their own homelands that they've been protecting for thousands and thousands of years. And I think, you know, we really need to hold the government of BC accountable and the RCMP accountable for abysmal treatment of land defenders that are doing this work for the benefit of us all. And I will finish with, you know, what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation of me not understanding, I think for about 20 years uh, doing this work, that, um, Healing and joy is revolutionary, and I totally didn't, I never included myself in that sacred hoop that I talked about. I just kept going, 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 because I said, we, we're running out of time. We don't have enough time, so I'm just going to say yes to everything. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to be everything to everybody, um, until I basically became a skeleton and became bedridden, and um, and like Naisha said, it is it is perpetuating white supremacy and cap capitalism because we are literally thinking that hyper-productivity is the only way of being. And I am here to say, no, it's not. Um, and healing justice for me is why what I really am very passionate about after um, becoming better in multiple times from this work. Um, and also healing justice, I want to say, is a framework that recognizes the impact of violence and trauma on individuals and communities and names collective processes that can help heal and transform these forces. Because we are in a society and system that actively targets black, brown, and indigenous and Asian bodies with violence, oppression, and terror. And terror. So it is critical to build movements that fight and achieve justice for all peoples. So how do we decolonize? That is what I ask everyone today. And I close with this slide of what the future of hope looks like for me. The future looks like self-determination through energy sovereignty, food security, of healing the land and healing ourselves. It's about relearning our sacred connection and responsibility to protect Mother Earth. It's about healing the trauma of white supremacy on all bodies so that we do not perpetuate our trauma on others. It's about placing that value back on the lives and bodies of indigenous women so we do not have a murder and missing indigenous women's two-spirited crises that is an epidemic across this country, across Turtle Island. And this is not just an indigenous problem. Self-liberation is also intimately tied to collective liberation. You know, we can't just do the self-help healing, individualized, it is about a collective, you know? And so truth-telling really is so important for me as well as we have the truth and reconciliation, but also telling the truth in spaces and places and discussions like this, because that is really how we start decolonizing our minds. And so here are some resources for anybody that um, is watching online and I won't name them all right now for the sake of time, but um, I ask you to follow us at Indigenous Climate Action and Sacred Earth Solar. And thank you so much for listening. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Melina. Thank you for all that wisdom. My main question actually relates to history, and you talked about history and the importance of knowing history. When you look back at the history of this country and other countries, whether it's colonialism or related issues, it, it, progress is impossible without understanding that history. Does it surprise you that in the year 2021, 
that there are still parts of the society that aren't familiar with the history. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's not only surprising, but it's also demoralizing because it makes the rest of the people that um, are recipients of this history more vulnerable. Because when we don't, when the history is not acknowledged, it is such a, has such a detrimental impact continually on society. It's so it's just, it, it's, yeah, it's so um, sad and frustrating. It's, it's like, I can't even express how um, unfortunate that is. Mm -hmm. You talked about the necessity of uh, a, a, a major shift in the way we look, a critical shift, I think is what you called it. As someone who communicates about not just building, but the necessity of hope, what do you think, and it's a big question, what do you think are the conditions necessary to allow for that critical shift? The truth telling. I think it's, it's really about people being okay with being uncomfortable. Because I think for a long time, People didn't want to be uncomfortable, so they would push it away, um, not want to address it, not want to look at it in the face of the history of 150 years of colonialism and the 100, 150 years of genocide. And so I think that is really what I, I hope um, Canadians are coming to terms with now um, with the Day of Reconciliation. Um, but that is just, again, it can't just be a day. It needs to be a whole journey for every single person that makes their home here on Turtle Island. It is a journey, and it's a very first step to a very long undoing and unlearning. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for the presentations, uh, very powerful presentations, and huge, a long list of issues to consider. And so I'd like to give a chance to the audience to ask questions um, we are taking questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit yours via Slido. If you haven't already, just go to sli.do in your device's web browser and enter the six-digit code 151025. But in the interim, I thought maybe I would ask just the at least the first question to kick off the discussion. And it's actually something, Anjali, that you've said in the past, that you think that the, the, the whole idea of fighting, uh, being involved in the fight, uh, of the climate crisis is to understand power. Can you talk about what it means to understand power? <laughs> oh, this, so this was from a while ago, yeah. I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, to, to the climate crisis, you know, I think it's, um, it's so multi-layered and it, it is so, um, multi-dimensional and it's not just an issue of like energy um, it didn't happen by accident it happened through um, it happened through a series of of interrelated processes mm -hmm. domination and colonialism and the separation of man and nature and um, global like geopolitical forces and like the inequality between different countries and different populations around the world like all contributed to this um to this crisis that we're in mm -hmm. and so um i think it is imperative to understand power at multiple levels to understand the climate crisis mm -hmm. um power in the form of colonialism and how that took place historically over hundreds of years around the world um and then and then power in terms of how um, how things work here at home. Um, you know, we have the RCMP right now that are essentially being deployed as a private security force for a company. And that is a deliberate policy choice to use power in that way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a power dynamic in enforcing the injunction of the pipeline company, Coastal Gas Link, over the Delgamook decision that granted Wet'suwet'en people's rights and titles over their land. Mm -hmm. So to me, the climate crisis is an issue of power, and um, it's about how power is wielded, and, um, and I think understanding that helps us to subvert it and build our own power from the ground up. Now, as a retort to that in your discussion today, you said that it is time for the people to disrupt. What does that mean? Um, yeah, we, we have these toxic dynamics of power that have created the climate crisis. And um, 
I, I talk about the inertia of, of the climate crisis. You know, we, we have this, this logic that I spoke about that is, a, that is um, extractive industries um, building on the legacy of colonialism and upheld by the state. And that is a logic that has so much inertia to it that even though we understand, even though climate science is so um, advanced now and even though it's happening all around us and climate disruption is upon us, um, somehow our governments can't find it in themselves to say, okay, emergency level, let's pull out all the stops and take emergency level action. Let's have an emergency just transition act. Let's um, urgently return land to indigenous peoples. Um, they just can't bring themselves to do it. They're not in emergency mode because that, that extractive logic has so much inertia. Mm -hmm. And so the disruption is where we, we puncture through and we, um, we make it impossible for that, or we expose, we expose um, the choices at the heart of that logic. We expose the violence at the heart of that logic. And so that disruption could happen through you know, activism, um, which is supposed to be disruptive, is supposed to be uncomfortable, and it's supposed to be um, fundamentally um, coming from a totally different logic than mm -hmm. what created this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and that disruption could also be any form of collective action that um, prioritizes joy and hope and healing because that is revolutionary as, as both these sisters spoke to today. And Aisha, you talked about it, but you were talking, you talked about radical action and you've, you've, you were planning a protest before all of this started. I'm curious if you could talk about, we've talked a little bit about the importance of hope, but what is the importance of protest? Yeah, um, I recently, I, I've been studying business at um, UBC and through that I've really noticed that it is essential for the people to take action and power. Um, like Anjali said, it is time to disrupt. Um, there is very much like a governed state of what the crown thinks of is acceptable, um, and that is not the case. Um, there are different forms of direct action that are necessary in order to achieve the necessary changes that we want to see in the world. Um, and so I think protests really help gather people power and just really help us unite in the power that we have. Um, yeah. In announcing this this uh, gathering, um, the SFU president, Joy Johnson, said that people are looking for ways to get involved in climate justice. How would you advise them on how to even begin, Melina? I would advise folks to begin with um, decolonization first, um, because a lot of the problems that we see in the climate justice movement um, could be avoided if that folks really understood kind of their place and space um, in the spaces that they take up. And so for me, it, and that's part of what we'll be, I'll be announcing later around um, the organization that we wanted to profile, but decolonization is, is incredibly important because if you don't understand the lands in which you make your home, then how do you have a relationship with that? And how do you have a relationship with um, a wider collective? And it, a lot of times it creates a lot of hurt, um, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of division when we do not um, really come from the same place and same foundation. So it's really important for people to um, understand what de decolonial, decolonial values are. And Naisha, and would you, both of you, just answer the same question? Yeah, um, I think Melina put it really, uh, really well put. Um, I think another really big thing for people that they can do is really understand the value that they have and what they can do. I think everyone has a role that they can play in the climate movement, um, even if it means that you're a parent and you're supporting your kid um, because that's all that you can do when you're a busy parent. Um, or if it means that you are working a part-time job and you're a bus driver and you're recycling or you're reusing your plastic bags, um, I think there is limited capacity in what you can do, but you can realize that you have capability and that is a big step into realizing the action that you can take. Anjali, 
What would you advise someone who has no idea, who has no connection to any groups or organizations uh, involved? What would you say? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think it's so important to start from where you are at this moment, and so I guess m like a one practical way is to look at where you are, look at the sector that you're in, and recognize that we're all connected through the various things that we do in our lives, our jobs, our hobbies, our, our religion, or our faith. We're connected to networks of people, and networks of people are a tremendous source of power, and um, organizing can begin literally anywhere. Um, if you go to a religious institution, you can just go and start a conversation with the people that you're networked with. And I think incredible things come out of those conversations. And then tapping in your collective efforts to ongoing movements. Presumably there's going to be a COP27 coming up eventually. I wonder if you think there's still a utility to those kinds of meet meetings, or are you essentially saying that there's no point? I think there's tremendous power and value in those gatherings because, um, uh, first of all, there, there are people who can gather from all over the world to articulate how our struggles are similar. Um, as I mentioned, that same story of land dispossession and extractive industries plays out similarly around the world. And so there's so much power in people coming together and saying, the same. This is the same pattern, um, and and so you can't um, you can't sort of like apply these false solutions to this pattern that's playing out because it's still happening and it's only exacerbating. Um, and then you know we can get together and we can share our tactics and we can share our stories and we can amplify each other's um, work, which is really tremendously valuable. Um, I I do believe that that the UN process has. Um, has value and has worth, and it is, um, it is, I consider it to be an open site of struggle, um, just like other problematic sites of struggle, like electoral politics, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. It is an open site of struggle, and so it's, it's there for us to reclaim, and it's there for us to restore integrity. Melina, your thoughts on that? I mean, I come from it from a different, I've gone to COP, I've been a part <laughs> of UN processes since I was a teenager and um, I feel pretty critical about it at this point in this age seeing that there's been 26 <laughs> cops mm -hmm. and a lot of resources um, and funds that have been utilized and I do agree with what Anjali said in, in having the collective come together to share story strategy and amplify and um, understand um, the issues and the colonial powers at hand that they're dealing with. But at the same time, I think after I left one of the cops, I said, I don't think I'm ever gonna return because I felt like, what are we doing locally to organize to become climate resilient when, you know, I won't swear, but when stuff hits the fan, you know, when, when we have BC flooding, when we have all of the things that we're seeing now, are we ready? And we're not, we're not ready. You know, and I myself the same ask myself the same thing. I've been organizing on climate issues for over you know fifteen years, and I'm like, can I grow my own garden? Can I you know survive? And I think for a good majority of us, that answer is no. Mm -hmm. And you know, the COP processes is not going to get us so far. A far away kind of you know, climate pact and agreement isn't going to make the same, um, in my opinion, the same type of change that we need to see on the ground here and now, locally, regionally, and federally. Um, so I think, I just think it's important and it's, it's valued, but it's also we need to really, really work on the ground more so than we've ever been doing. Okay. Naisha, last word to you on COP. Yeah, um, I think these two put it very eloquently. Um, I do think there is value, like they both mentioned, but I think at the end of the day, it's not enough. And change, I believe, happens at the grassroots, um, and it happens from the ground up. And so there is so much essential work that Indigenous land defenders are doing and other groups are doing that does not fall under COP. Um, it does have its place, I believe, but in general, I think there is just so much more value and we need collective action and we need 
to address the scale of the climate crisis that is not going to just be solely addressed by COP by itself. Thank you very much. Um, we'll turn to audience questions right now, and we're still accepting questions, just so you know, through Slido, so keep them coming. Um, here's the first one. I'm an SFU professor sitting uh, a tree at, at the base of Burnaby Mount, Mountain, sorry, blocking construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Apologies. I expect to be arrested by militarized RCMP tomorrow. How would you recommend stopping this project that will worsen climate change? This is from Tim. Um, Melina. I mean, it has to be a multi-pronged approach to stop any extractive industry. Um, you have to, um, you know, like, like this um, valiant professor is doing right now, um, putting his, you know, very body um, in front of the destructive fossil fuel project that is exacerbating climate change is, is an important one and needed, um, but we need to see um, addressing these issues as, as a multi-pronged way of, you know, so it's like it's, it's, it's attacking the needing divestment, so attacking where the money's coming from, um, also the policy that is allowing these projects to go through, the governments that are allowing the company. So it's like we need to um, look at it as, as a type of strategy. And so that's, that's how I would see it as a campaigner, um, to kind of also educating the public. There's, there's so many important places and spaces for every single person that has a skill to lend itself to stopping a project like that. Yeah. Uh, would you like to add something, Angelique, to that? No, no, that was okay. perfect. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a collective effort and it takes place in multiple sites. Uh, and the next question from the audience, how do we combat extreme ideologies to come together to make sustainable progress for the future? Angelique, any thoughts <laughs> on that? It's a tough question. Yeah, uh, I think one thing that's been a real challenge for the climate justice movement is, you know, we've seen a rise in extreme right ideology, um, like coming into positions of power around the world. I mean, we've seen like various um, like sort of far right leaders rise, and um, in the last in the last five years even, and I think that is. Um, that is connected to climate in that these are the, ideolo the ideologies that support um, the things that drive the climate crisis, that's, that support, you know, extreme prioritization of corporate um, power um, and extractive industries and, um, and, and do not... Um, and sort of do not seek to protect the most vulnerable among us. Um, both human and non-human, and so um, I think I, I I don't have the answer to how to combat that. For me, it looked like reevaluating my relationship to different systems of power. I had always been an activist who never um, who sort of dismissed electoral politics as a site that I was not interested in engaging with, and I had to evolve my understanding of that and understand that. Um, it, it is a, another site of struggle that we that we engage in, and um, and that more people from social movements that are um, progressive and um, and radical and believe in um, believe in protecting the most vulnerable, believe in justice, um, to step into those spaces and step into those positions of power. Okay, here's a question. I think all of you will probably have something to say about is. What do the hopeful futures that you imagine look like? And is ongoing collapse a prerequisite for this transformation? This is a question from Katie McPherson. Naisha, do you want to at least take on the second part of that? Is it, is it necessary that collapse has to happen before the transformation begins? I mean, I think the transformation has honestly already started to begin with different communities of color. but. The collapse of oppressive systems, specifically of white supremacy, colonialism, and capitalism, have to collapse. And it is all of our duties to work and actively work to dismantle it. Um, I don't think we can have success. I don't think we can have true balance with nature when we are practicing extractivism. So, yeah. Melina, your thoughts on that? I mean, I wish it wasn't a prerequisite. <laughs> 
I feel like for some reason it is, though, because we keep kind of going towards this cliff. Um, but I, I would say, like, if I'm imagining and, like, and envisioning a future that I would want to be a part of, it would be where people are living in collectives in a way where, you know, you actually know your neighbors and you actually share food with them or you grow food or you share, you know, like, have cooperatives. Um, so I feel like this kind of, the urban settings, um, I think, unfortunately, might have to collapse. And it's a scary thing to, that I, I, more and more, I don't want to actually live in an urban setting. And I think it's just maybe because I'm a res kid and I know what it's like to live out in the bush and it's so nice and quiet. Um, but I really would hope that people do bring back kind of like gardening and the ability to grow your own food, the ability to make your own energy or the ability to like forage. Um, but I think it's a really hard thing because we're such a we're such um, an urban uh, society, and that's and I think that's you know going to drive us over a, a collapse, unfortunately. Angelique, um, yeah, unfortunately, you know the climate crisis has been real for people around the world um, for a long time now, and so collapse has already either happened or is underway for so many populations around the world. Um, so that's one kind of collapse that, yeah, again, is already happening. I, I think that in order to take the emergency level action that we need, business as usual will have to collapse. And that my, my work is to essentially... Um, advocate for a collapse that is uh, a just transition, acknowledging that business as usual has to end and something new has to be born, but to make that transition as least violent as possible um, and to make sure that as many people as possible are not falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely, this paradigm has to collapse. Um, and but I, but I refuse to... I refuse to um, sort of um, say that um, with any kind of inevitability about about being willing to sacrifice anyone in that collapse. I that's my life's work is to avoid as much of that sacrifice as possible. Thank you. Here's a question that we sort of briefly touched on in the discussion earlier, but we this gets right to the heart of it, is most environmental political parties around the world seem to be losing influence. Why do you think that is, Melina? I don't know why. Why? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I really feel about it. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's this disconnect somehow um, between the inability for what we see as the left or progressive to really call things out when they become political parties. Um, so we see a lot of people, you know, myself included, that had, say, a, like previous former colleagues at Greenpeace that are now like, you know, ministers of, you know, the environment and things like that and, and no longer say the things that we need to hear to be said at that level. And so I think there's somehow this idea that we um, have to, or they have to censor themselves when we need people, like Anjali said at the very beginning of this um, discussion, that we need leaders to really be leading and we don't have people leading on climate. So I think people are getting um, disengaged, um, not because they don't care, but they don't believe in the systems that because um, they're just still upholding all of the, you know, colonial um, capitalistic systems and are not really calling out um, and changing what we need to, what we need to see changed. Um, Naisha, your thoughts about why environmental parties, for example, aren't appealing to youth? Yeah, um, I think, unfortunately, a big reason is that youth are losing hope in the system. Um, we've perpetually seen a lack of climate action and a lack of political will to meet our needs. And so I think there's just an overall apathy towards it. And I think it is unfortunate um, because this is the current system in which we exist. And so it is the tool that we need to use to facilitate change. But I don't blame the youth for losing, um, for losing trust um, because it's definitely something I've had to deal with too. I do think that we can work towards 
building better um, trust with political systems by introducing newer, younger, and more representative voices in politics. Um, it is a lot tiring, it is very tiring, I think, to see the same white old men um, <laughs> in positions of power. And so I do think that is one thing that is really missing and causing us to have a disconnect with politics and one thing that we can change. This is the final question from our audience, and I'd like to ask it to all three of you, and starting with you, Anjali, is what advice do you have for people dealing with burnout and climate depression? Hmm. Unfortunately, I think we're in an age where um, this is all going to be coming at us hard and fast and um, without any sort of respite. Like, I know that's been the case this year. It's just been one thing after another, and that is overwhelming to, like, the the spirit and to um like our you know we're not equipped to deal with change that fast like I don't think humans are equipped to deal with that much change and that much grief like all at once so fast and so but unfortunately this is our new reality and the only antidote that I know to that is collective action and I've seen this happen over and over again in, as an activist in activist settings, when people come together around a cause um, and you have a common purpose together and you say, we can actually do this together, um, that is a tremendous antidote to a lack of hope or to despair, to del disillusionment. Um, it sounds really corny, but hope is the antidote to disillusionment. Um, and I think we can only really act on that collectively. So. That's my very sort of, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Melina and then Naisha. What was the question again? The question is, <laughs> how, how do you, what sort of advice would you give to people who are living through on a daily basis, you know, the idea of, of, of burnout and climate depression? Yeah, I think I blocked the question out. Because um, <laughs> I, I experience that on a daily. Um, but I do really think it's important for people that work in a collective to understand that we're passing a baton. So it's not always that you have to run a sprint all the time and everyone else is running a sprint beside you and you're all just getting haggard and tired. Um, we are literally running a marathon and we are in the work for a long, the long haul. And I, so I think a lot of us, we feel guilty when we take a step back, when we don't want to. Um, we feel guilty. I, I know I did. And then I just kind of kept pushing and pushing and, and, and not honoring the body and vessel that you're brought into this life, you know, and, and for me, this work is spiritual. And so therefore I have to take part of, take care of my spirit. I have to take care of the body and the vessel and honor that. And a lot of times capitalism doesn't want you to do that. It's, it's all about, you know, workers and kind of worker bees. And, and if you're, you're hyper productivity and you're only a value, if you um, are a highly functional, hyper productive citizen and role model, and if you take a step back, like you have um, no identity anymore and you're, you're no longer, you know, it's a throwaway culture. And so I think we really need to fight that and, and, and support one another when we need to take a step back and support family, support friends, support, figure out collective systems of care to ensure that we're upholding those people even when they take a step back. And we don't have that in our movement spaces right now. And that's why we see so many people leaving them and or committing suicide like I've had friends do. Um, so I think we really need to look at the ways in which we're engaging and not perpetuating systems of harm, systems of harm that by, by continuing to, to behave in this manner. And it's okay to take a break. Naisha, final word to you. Yeah, so eloquently put by both of these two ladies. But um, honestly, I wish I had advice for myself because I definitely don't fully know the answer. Um, it's really hard. I think the key, like I mentioned, was it is centering joy and love. But I also think that it is really letting yourself feel your feelings and understanding why these are caused. Um, Something I didn't get to say earlier about collapse and why it's necessary is I think sometimes when we don't have to view collapse as a bad thing, um, in nature, sometimes when forest fires strike, it allows the forest to grow new. Um, and I think we can view that and burnout in a similar way. Sometimes when we have these really, really, we push to these extremes, we can use them as opportunities to build better. Um, 
This happened with the Great Depression. It was obviously a very, very awful time in history, but it allowed for the development of social services. And so when we have, when we get to positions of burnout or when we get to positions that are really dark, I think the key is to look, at, look for hope and use hope as a building block to build for a better society. Um, I think that's really key. And I think also like these two ladies said it best with taking breaks and understanding your capacity. Um, a lot of times burnout happens as a result of perpetuating systems of hyper-productivity. And if we really want to solve the climate crisis, that means dismantling capitalism. And that also means building sustainable culture that prioritizes your health and happiness. Um, so yeah. Thank you, That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you to all three of you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Anjali, Naisha, and Melina. And before we uh, finish completely, actually, we are going to welcome back Joanne Curry, VP of External Relations at Simon Fraser University, who's going to get one more comment from each of our panelists. Great. Thank you. Uh, what an incredible conversation. I am, uh, I am walking away with such hope that there are strong women, all four of you uh, here, uh, leading the way in climate justice. And thank you for sharing your stories, uh, your wisdom, uh, your advice, um, and, and also some very tangible steps that we can all take. So thank you so much. Uh, the evening is not quite over. Uh, we have a, an opportunity now to showcase groups that are making real tangible change and hopefully direct some of the power in this room and in the virtual space toward collective action. Uh, it's been my honor to speak with all of you this evening and, and uh, looking forward to hearing more about groups that we should be aware of and supporting. So I'll start with Anjali. Uh, you spoke about New Chalat uh, Land Bl Bl Back Fund in your presentation, and I know you wanted to speak a little bit more about them. Yes, and I, I actually, um I ran out of time to, to speak about them, so it's a good opportunity. Um, part of my work at COP26 um, was supporting New Chatlet Nation, which is a very small nation off the northwestern tip of Vancouver Island to um, bring their story to the world stage at COP. And their story is that they are they're a very small nation of 160 people, and they are taking a legal case against the province right now um, to gain back rights and title of their land um, because they have watched um, their traditional homelands over the course of a thousand years get completely degraded through extractive industries and through mismanagement and through um, irresponsible land uh, management practices. And, um, and so this case could be precedent setting and um, a really, really powerful reversal of that of that logic of colonial extractivism that I was um, talking about earlier. Um, and it's it's legal cases like this that restore indigenous rights and title um, to land um, that I think are, are extremely powerful climate justice solutions and we should support them. And um, so there, this case has been going on for four years and it will culminate in the court part of it uh, in March and um, Part of my work will be to create some, some hype and excitement around that court case, and everyone's welcome. It's on March 14th. Um, and so I supported Nuchatlet to go to COP and, and tell their story on the world stage there, and um, they could really use some funds to support this legal case because um, they're using a really, really amazing lawyer who's one of the best in the game in indigenous legal orders, and um, it's very expensive. Great, thank you. I'm not sure if we have a video. Um, if so, it will play shortly. If not, um, what uh, SFU Public Square will be doing is we'll be putting the names of these organizations and links on the website. We've never relinquished the chat, so we truly believe it's ours yet. We're not just fighting for new chat, but we wanna show the world that we can manage better, protect better and we can enhance better and there'll be enough for everybody. New Chatlet was a paradise. I think it can be that way again and I want the world to be able to 
come and visit New Chaplets to see the beauty and just want it back. Everybody will know about New Chaplet, this tiny little community that's taking on the province, Canada, and the logging companies. We're 180 strong and we will win. Great, thank you so much, Anjali, for bringing attention to this uh, important work. Uh, I'm gonna turn it now to Naisha. Um, who should we be paying attention to, in your opinion? Yeah, I wanted to highlight the group, uh, the nonprofit Raven Trust. This is a group Sustainability has worked a lot with in the past. Um, we've helped organize fundraisers to donate and raise funds for them. They're a non nonprofit that raises legal funds for indigenous cases. Um, and indig a lot of indigenous frontline cases as well. Um, so it is, I think Anjali said it really well, um, there's just this very, very big need for, I think that in general there's been a theme today of a very big need for decolonization. Um, and the Crown is perpetuating a lot of violence against indigenous peoples since the inception of Canada. Um, and so we need to fight back, and Raven Trust is a group that is actively working towards that. Thank you, Naisha, and I know we have a short video about Raven to share. I'm Jeff Nichols, a member of the Lackawalam's First Nation and a lawyer. And as the board president, I'm excited to introduce you to Raven, which stands for Respecting Aboriginal Values and Environmental Needs. Raven is the only nonprofit charity in Canada with a mandate to raise legal defense funds to help Indigenous peoples defend their Aboriginal rights and title and the integrity of their ancestral lands. Aboriginal rights are enshrined in Canada's constitution, but those rights are regularly trampled or ignored in favor of socially and environmentally irresponsible industries like tar sands and mining. And it's one thing to have a right, but it's quite another to defend it in court against the deep pockets of government and industry we believe Indigenous nations hold the balance of power with respect to land protection by virtue of their constitutionally protected rights. We raise funds in partnership with nations so they go to court fully represented without having to divert money from critical community resources like housing, education and mental health care. Our work is unique because we are challenging unjust and outdated colonial law and policy to protect Indigenous rights and the environment for all of us. We are building a foundation for future generations by working to establish precedents that advance Indigenous rights and sovereignty. With your support, we could build upon a nationwide movement galvanized by environmental justice led by Indigenous peoples. I thank you for your consideration and welcome you into the circle. Great, thank you, Naisha. Melina, who have you chosen to spotlight this evening? So I decided to spotlight an organization that's up and coming. It's called D, oh, music. <laughs> um, so I decided to spotlight an organization that's up and coming called Decolonize Together to be able to empower people from all walks of life and backgrounds to take a training with um, decolonial um, BIPOC and settler trainers that work with universities, companies, organizations to have decolonial trainings. Um, and I think that really would help um, set the framework for climate justice and all kind of justices that we need to work together towards solving, so. Great. Thank you. And I don't believe we have a video. There we? should be a video that should was sent. There should be a sent. video. There we go. Piali, Kuali Tanatsik, Niatoka, Nicola Angelica Sanchez Hood, Nimaya Pipiol, Den Cuscatlan. I'm so happy to be with all of you here today. What a special thing to come together to learn. Although it's become a common theme in Canada that we talk about intergenerational trauma for Indigenous people, one thing that's not talked about is the intergenerational trauma that's also had to happen for settler people to be complicit in such a violent history. 
There's not a single corner of the world that colonization hasn't been enacted upon. And I really want to dispel this myth today that decolonization is the work of Indigenous people. Whether you have ancestors that were colonizers or colonized, we are all colonized people. And so this work of decolonization is really work that we need to come together to do with one another, equally accepting our roles, our locations, our privileges, in ways in which we can start to move towards a future that looks like healing, that looks like justice, that looks like dismantling systems of oppression. And so if I could just leave you with one message today, it would be this. This history is not your fault, but it absolutely is your responsibility. I'm Nikki, the founder of Decolonize Together. I'm Trudy Williams, and I'm a part of Decolonize Together. Hi, I'm Pepin Abuisa, and I'm with Decolonize Together. I'm Feather Nault, and I'm a part of Decolonize Together. Hi, I'm Chantelle Chapman, and I'm part of Decolonize Together. I'm Jacqueline Jennings, and I'm with Decolonize Together. Thank you all for sharing these incredible organizations with us. SFU Public Square will be sending out links and resources to each of these three organizations and a follow-up email for everyone who registered for the event and will also post these, post these videos on their website. Um, I'd like to thank again Nala, Anjali, Nesha and Melina for this incredible conversation tonight. And thanks to all of you, uh, both in person and online, for joining us this evening. I hope these ideas and stories and examples of great work give you tools and inspiration to take climate action. It's my honor now to welcome back Amanda to close us in song. Boychka Hosiam, Yewen Hart Nichem, Yewen Hart is Coquin, so We Chokyo and Chokmot, We Chokyo, Chin Chin Straight, Yewen Hart and Squalo and Teat Seats. With Hauk Tea, Quatlino Tea, Storm Och, not the Quick Queen. I said it's extremely important the words that you're saying. It's really important the work that you're doing. Let us all continue one heart, one mind, one spirit. Let us all continue to support one another and work together. It's really important that we continue to remember the words of our ancestors. Back in 1906, Chief Joe Capilano traveled from here to England to question the integrity of the crown. And we were not welcomed with open arms. We had to bang on the door. We had to wait for our turn to speak. And we're still echoing those words today. And we're not going to stop. We're gonna keep plowing forward. We're gonna hold each other's hand and we're gonna push each other forward to keep telling the truth, to speak the truth, to remind the people, you're living in our homelands. You're living in our homelands of our ancestors. We have survived millennia of climate change. We survived the flood. We survived the ice age. We survived colonization. We're still here. Chitwa e tete. Chitwa e tete. We are still here. And we still remember what our grandmothers and our grandfathers taught us. And we're going to echo those words. My great great grandchildren are going to echo those words. And I look forward to that day when I'm a great grandma and I get to tell them, yep, you go say those words of our people. So I sing this song and that prayer and that strength. I think of my grannies, my grandpas. They talk to us about the importance of the salmon, the importance of the trees, the cedar tree, the longhouse. Paddling by canoe, we hold ourselves with integrity. We don't hold ourselves above anyone else. We are not above the water. The water is sacred, it's our life giver. When the last tree falls, so will the people. That is a solid prophecy. 
I believe that prophecy, as we can see what's happening in the solo territory. So this is a prayer song that we continue to remember that strength, continue to support each other, remembering those sacred teachings. And wherever you are on Turtle Island, you're in indigenous territory. There are teachings of those lands, how to respect and live in harmony with that world. So this song is a prayer song. And if we could all pray together, pray for everyone who's impacted by climate change, impacted by food sovereignty, impacted by poverty, that there's enough in the world for all of us to be wealthy. There's enough in the world for all of us to be fed. <clears throat> a song comes from Sahualia. It's the greeting of the day. Thank you for being here, taking the time out of your day to be here, to come and listen to the words of our people. These are women I really respect, and I'm just so honored to be here today on behalf of our communities. Start this off in a good way. I pray that you all have a safe ride home. Pray for your families during this time, this hard time. And that we're all safe and sound in our homes. Thank you, Amanda, for that beautiful song and for being with us this evening. One final set of thank yous. I really want to acknowledge and thank Janet Weber, Executive Director of SFU Public Square, and her incredible team for producing this event. Uh, to our partners at Van City for their incredible partnership, and to the Cultic Kulch team for their hospitality and for this wonderful space. And just acknowledge Bethany and Promosa for their stage direction and technical wizardry and our volunteers that are here with us tonight. We couldn't do it without you. And also to Ann Penman and the team at CBC Ideas. So thank you and good night. <laughs>